And uh, hello, everyone. Welcome back to Conversations About CVI. I've got my shirt on. I'm in my study, as you all know. And uh, as you all, if you don't know, I'm Professor John Ravenscroft from the University of Edinburgh. And today I am really looking forward to this. Uh, uh, we've had to wait for about a month or so to get this meeting together because we're so busy with our schedules. And I've just spent the whole time reading all of your papers and I'm absolutely delighted to introduce Professor Els Ortobus. Hello Els. Hello John. <laughs> How are you? How are you today? Fine, fine. Good. Thank well, thank you very much for taking the time to be with us and have this conversation today. Um, uh, so look, I I've begun to know you quite well. I know you very well from your papers and I, you know, uh, and uh, wow, how many of them there are. They just keep stacking up and oh, brilliant, brilliant. Absolute, the whole range of gamut. And I shall, at the end of the conversation, put some links on to some of your papers so people can easily okay. access them. But who are you, Els? Well, tell me a little bit about you, you know, your research area, where you came from, your interest in CVI. I know you, but other people might not know you. Okay. Um, so I started out with uh, being a pediatrician, but then I went on to pediatric neurology and rehabilitation. Um, and I think already when I started with my pediatric residency that I said to the staff members, uh, when I finished, I want to do something with disability. Um, and then I ran into Peter Steers, who developed the L94. Mm -hmm. Um, and so together with him, I did a few years of CVI clinic, and that's where my interest for the visual perception uh, grew. Um, and um, yeah, then I started uh, doing a PhD. And actually, at first, the topic was follow up of the preterms. But actually, then I turned it into CVI. And so in the end, um, it became a PhD on yeah, different aspects of uh, cerebral visual impairments. Um, but so in addition to CVI, I also work as a staff member here at the university hospitals in Leuven uh, for the children with cerebral palsy and at the Center for Developmental Disabilities where we have the CVI clinic. I um, also coordinate the follow-up of the preterms. Um, so we also have a PhD actually running on that, but that has nothing to do with CBI, <laughs> but with resilience and executive functioning uh, in the real small one. So that's also interesting. Um, and I guess that's the most important. Yeah. Gosh, yeah. So you, 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 you combine being a, a practicing working doctor pediatrician with also being you know for as that I can see one of the leading academics in CVI as well my goodness well don't exaggerate John <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess, I guess in in, uh, in Belgium um, yeah it was us here in Leuven who started out the CVI work with Peter Steers then and then in uh, around 2007 or a little bit before uh, we started out a Flemish working group on CVI, so we unite all the CVI clinics that we have in Flanders and in Brussels. Um, and I'm the president of that. Um, but yeah, um, but um, yeah. Other than that, I mean, there's there's really a lot of good work in 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 Flanders and Belgium around CVI, and already a long history of looking at it. I think, yeah. Yeah, and that long history is really quite interesting, I think, you know, I mean, I mean I'm looking back at, at your papers and, and your career, and then I'm looking back around CVI and, you know, how it's really in the last decade or so really come to the forefront. But, you know, one of the things that, we, that you'll see in these conversations and people ask me about is, is definitions of CVI, right? Yeah. You know, what exactly is CVI? How do we define it? And, you know, I, I flip sometimes, do we need a definition or do we not? Is it about need? Do I need to be concerned about a definition? So what are your thoughts about that, Else? Do, do I need to be worried that we don't have a formalized definition yet? Mm, I don't think you have to be too worried about it. I think what the main concern is, is that not everybody thinks the same about what CBI is. How do I think the most important thing is that we agree on when we 
say a child has CVI? Do we need a definition for that? Maybe. And the other thing is, of course, that certainly in Belgium, people do need labels in order to get access to their help. Yeah, I, I was going to come another, on. To that's question. another thing. And, and as CVI is not as such a diagnosis, also not in the DSM, for example. Yeah. In, in certain countries, I know now by doing European projects that it is a problem for the people to get the, the help they are entitled to, actually. So I think it's an unanswered question. Yeah, that, that, that's the way out of that. Nicely done. It. I, mean, I, I, I think you're right. I mean, I think um, I, I'm beginning to be less worried about it. I am leaning towards that brain-based VI, you know, I, I, you know, I kind of, I kind of get why that is, and, and, and I'm sort of more liberal, I think, with my understanding about it than others, you know, like I say, nystagmus, well, that kind of is brain-based as well, you know, and, and I'm sort of <laughs> okay for that, you know, and, and, and but, but, but what does come, so, so, so I'm relaxed about not having an agreed definition per se, but I'm not relaxed about is access to services, right? Is, yeah. is, is that shared That's understanding? It. And I and I think those who work with CVI do have a reasonably shared understanding of, of what it means. But I guess if We're growing you, closer to each other, I think. Yes, yes, that's right. I, I think I think initially we might have had some kind of distance, but there is convergence happening. You're right, we're not there yet, uh, but we are getting closer, I, I think. I think amongst the Europeans, we may have a, 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 a we're getting more close, and then we need to join our, our, our US colleagues, and then Australian, I, I think, need to come on board as well. But we're getting there. I think we're getting there. But it is that access to services, right? If you if you need someone to tick a box, right, that this child has CVI in order to get access services, then we need some kind of definition just for that. I think you know. And I, yeah. And I, well, the question, of course, is whether uh, our governments uh, shouldn't switch to not not needing any more a label in order to give services to the people. And that's what we call inclusion and, and integration as well, that you do not have to have per se an, a strict label in order to get uh, to get help. And that's what we are evolving to here in, in Flanders and the whole of Belgium as well. But it's still difficult. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think in terms of Scotland, we, we have it in the sense that it's identity, it's based on need rather than a label kind of thing. But I know in England, that's not the case. And in fact, you know, some children do need a formal diagnosis and others say to get access to a QTVI or something like that, you know, so, so even within the UK, you know, we've got this disparity between need and then a formal a tick box by an ophthalmologist or a pediatrician in order for that to get. So, so whilst, um, yeah, so whilst I'm relaxed about not having one, and I think there is um, convergence happening, I, I do worry about those parents and children who aren't getting the need because of not having that standard one. Like I say, it's not in IDC 11, it's not in DSM, you know, so, you know, it's all that, that needs to be resolved. And, and I think, if we can resolve it by brain-based VI, as simple as yep. that, then we're happy. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just generalize it. Just yeah, yeah. So lazy eye, why not? All right, yep. okay. why not? All right, uh, you know, <laughs> just you know, the, the amount of instances where that person with you know, with, with that issue might need a tiny bit of support and then they're out the books right you know those with nystagmus will need more support kind of thing and so you know my view is why not you know let's just why not I, and i'm sure yeah. all the people who are watching this will go because of the amount of workload we'll have yeah and, yeah well, i was just thinking about that and the amount of workload not not really that but yeah if then every every child would if we would by that end up in another strict system of everybody needs so many hours of uh, of support then we're going the wrong way again so but yeah yeah yeah, yeah something yeah. to it's say to everything yeah that yeah, debate is quite, quite 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 difficult and nuanced no we need to think about it much more i think good so so we haven't resolved the issue of definition right here's another one we're not going to resolve right um look uh, uh, 
questionnaires, right? Okay. So, <laughs> I knew you were going to ask that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course I am, right? Right. I'm talking to you for a start. I mean, you wrote one for one. For, for instance. So, um, look, you know, probably the most common thing I get asked on my CVI course is, Oh, what questionnaire should I use, John? Right, there, 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 there are so many now. Which, which one should I use? I'll give you my answer uh, a bit later on. But I, uh, but what's your answer, Els? Well, uh, let's hope that it'll be the same one as yours, in the sense that I also think, okay, there's so many, and you have just have to know what are their flaws, what are the good things about it, and then you can use it for the purpose you want to use it. Um, you have questionnaires that we can probably use for screening because we have published about it. Um, there are others who are more surveys, like you want to have a good idea about uh, what exactly the problems are uh, of the CVI children or the children with CVI, excuse me, um, in, the, in their daily life. There are um, questionnaires that have been specifically developed for children with cerebral palsy even. Mm -hmm. um, and then we had that European project, Erasmus Plus Teach CVI, where we also developed new ones, but those really haven't been studied. But I hear here and there from other European colleagues, well, they're, they're very user-friendly and uh, yeah, so... There's no answer to that, um, as long as you know what you can use it for, I guess it's okay. Yeah, I mean, I mean actually, I think that's my answer, right, is, is to understand what the um, questionnaire is trying to do, uh, uh, understand the limitations, understand that some of them might be validated and some of them might not be. Uh, uh, and, and the other thing that I always say to my students is, yeah, 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 you've got questionnaires, but you have to use other things with it as well. You can't, yeah. you can't just base, base your support just on the questionnaire, right? No, because that's what I just wanted to add as well, because what we are also have been doing in the work that we do now around games eh, is, is actually make a good profile of the child and the questionnaire can be a part of that. What does the child have as problems in, in its daily life? what we get out of it when we do formal assessments, what is there to see on the MRI and, and put all those things together into a puzzle to, yeah, to understand his problems and to get the support he needs. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think that's right. So, so, you know, I think both of us agree, continue using the questionnaires along with something else, understand what they're for, why they're about and do that. So have we solved have we solved the questionnaire? Maybe we have. Maybe we solved the questionnaire issue, i.e., use what you want to understand it. Here's something else that we're not going to solve, right? Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, assessments, right? Assessments of CVI, right? Wow, that's a big thing. And 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 I know we're going to talk a little bit about some of your work and assessments, but. Tell me, tell me a little bit uh, uh, and help me because this seems to be a running theme, particularly in the last four or five conversations and the ones that I've done as well. Um, why, why is it important to have uh, um, assessments that are valid or, 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 or reliable? Why, why is that? Why can't we just, you know, suddenly um, just use, you know, uh, something that we think might work, right? Why is validity and reliability important in the work that we do? Okay, well, that's a, a question, uh, a good question. Um, of course, that's important. You, why do you need reliable tools? Of course, when you do the assessment and I do the assessment, we need to make sure that we, both of us have the same results and that we end up with a profile of the, of the child that is uh, similar, of course, and why do we need valid? Because, yeah, of course, if you use assessments that haven't been studied, you can never be sure that you are actually measuring what you are trying to measure, whether it discriminates CVI from something else, eh? uh, which is, of course, very difficult. And that's why I guess we are also struggling, certainly for developing assessment batteries for the younger ones. Um, um, so yeah, of course, when we use 
assessments. We want it to be as standard as possible. On the other hand, John, you might know that if we work with very young children and certainly the ones who have a multiple disability, that it's very, very difficult to use standardized uh, tools and that you, we do rely on our observations and some of the instruments that we use, like even the developmental tests, like a Bailey scale that <laughs> in, the, in the younger kids uh, adapted for their visual or motor problem, that we observe what we do with that material. And based on that, say, this can't be right. The discrepancy with, with other uh, functions is so big that this must be due to cerebral visual impairment or brain-based visual <laughs> impairment then. Um, so I guess we have to work towards um, valid and reliable tools, but uh, there's still a, a way to go there too. Um, and yeah, I've seen uh, your um, interview with Kathleen and she talked about uh, the CIVIT and then she talked about me uh, uh, also trying to develop something for the even younger kids. Eh? Um, and so indeed there we are we are struggling with the fact that we have normative data now for typically developing in typically developing children. But um, we had trouble finding those young kids with suspicion of or confirmed CVI, uh, but mainly with the ones with a pure ocular impairment, if you can say so. Um, so now I have talked to my colleagues in the Netherlands and we're going to do the validity study uh, over there together with them. And let's hope that within a year or two, we will have some, uh, yeah, some more news on that. Right. Excellent. I mean, I mean, I think, I mean, I think it is difficult. Look, I mean, I think, you know, we have variable definitions of CVI, you know, uh, and then, and then trying to validate against that kind of definition, you know, those children who have either suspected or confirmed as well you know i think it is difficult you know uh, but but you're right though we we do need to work more and i think as as you have demonstrated in your work you're doing now and in the past and kathleen and uh, a, a lot of people in the states as well we are working together now we're all collaboratively working to try our hardest you know and if parents watch these and i know they do you know, we are all together working to try and get some standardized validated tools. So we are all working from the same base, the same assessment. So like you say, when you do some assessment L's and I do, or Barry does in the States, we all know what we're doing. You know, we're all, we're all working there from that same base. And I think we're not there yet, but no. you know, we're getting there, I think. But we are getting there. And um, yeah, if you think of, uh, assessment tools for the very young ones. You, you might also know that Elisa Fazzi uh, has developed a, a, a battery for the infants actually, from which uh, she can deduct whether there is already a neurological slash visual perceptual problem. So also there we're moving uh, from young, young upwards and, and from the older kids downwards uh, to yeah, hopefully validated and reliable tools. Yeah, good, good, good. So we solved that then. <laughs> We're going to solve it. We're going to solve that one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, uh, and um, I think once we start solving those kind of issues, and then you know, it's it's almost like the chicken and egg. I wonder if then the definition will come out, or we need the definition to find. You know, it, there is a a chicken and egg thing about it, but. Um, I won't get into that again because that will just take us round and round in circles, I think. Yeah, but. yeah, yeah. But I know what you want to say, I think, with the chicken and the egg. And the, the other thing is, of course, that, yeah, we're working with kids that are developing. So what they show is different um, when they're young from where they're growing older. The visual, the pure visual perceptual things that we see, you cannot, uh, you won't detect those in the young ones because they haven't even developed the perception. That's right, yes, yes. I mean, you know, for um, those, so those that's, it would take a yeah. while for our visual process to, to develop and occur, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, so, yeah. Good, good. All right, so um, in terms of assessment and, and work that you're developing, um, I believe you've got some stuff you wanted to, to show and, and, and tell us, because uh, I'm quite excited about this. 
Okay, share. Um, when I looked at the, your conversation with Kathleen, I know she didn't show any any pictures of the civet, but um, actually, I mean, what we try to do with the G CVI toddlers, so the the G stands for Hanspool, which is the Center for Visually Disabled kin, uh, Children uh, near Leuven here. So we actually started from what we know that the problems in CVI are. Eh? What, what do the kids have problems with, with object recognition, with uh, contrast, with unconventional viewpoints, with cluttered scenes, etc. cetera. Um, and so that's why we, we came up with these uh, different yeah, images. And um, just like in, um well not completely uh the 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 task that they have to do is only answer or a point to actually one of the objects and that one of the alternative that we show them so first of all we have that uh, 3d duplo house <laughs> uh, we show it first in in 3d so they get to know the house as well and they have to find some objects uh, over there but at the end of the test we also show it in 2d so we have taken pictures of uh, the same uh, uh, constellations and then we, we can ask again the, the questions and see whether it makes a difference, whether we've shown it 3D or 2D. Yeah, and I think a lot of people forget about that, that practical transition between 3D and yeah. 2D. Yeah, yeah. That's it, that's it. Um, and then for the, the, so it's a battery for 24 months and 30 months old. Um, and for the 30 months old, the, the pictures over here are shown on a, on a, PC screen uh, on, a, on a laptop, but for the 24 months we've made booklets because they weren't able to keep their attention uh, on the screen. Um, and so they only have to point to the right answer and we of course checked whether they were able to uh, yeah, already have the, the language for the, the objects that we show them. Uh, and we have colored objects and uh, black and white objects. Um, cluttered scenes over here, the unconventional uh, viewpoints. Um, and so, yeah, that's um, how we developed it. Um, and we already yeah, tested or, or developed and collected the normative data um, in about 70 children of each uh, age. Um, but yeah, now we still have to do the, the validation in uh, showing this to children with CVI or suspicion of CVI and those with an ocular impairment. So it's, it's actually a lot of fun working with this uh, material and we do think that it will show something but we still have to work some further uh, on it. Right. Okay. And and so, how do you present the stimuli? Are they are they shown like as a group? So let's look at the was it the toothbrush, the comb, the spoon, and then the fork. Yeah, that's they're all, as, yeah. All, as one. Okay. Yeah, they're always shown as four alternatives over here. Um, and when you see the two alternatives here, it's it's just uh, the two of them. So this these are the the screens like you would see them or the pages in the book. All right. Okay. 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 And do, and do that. I'm wondering, if maybe a bit young, as well. If it be, I don't know if you're doing this or not, but I'm I'm beginning to move into this. Is also looking at eye tracking to see where the children look at. Yeah. Uh, well, we we didn't do that in this uh, particular uh, project, but we do have some experience now. Uh, in our gaming uh, projects, uh, because we added uh, eye tracking there just to get to know what it would tell us and whether it would add some information to the visual profile uh, of the children. But we're still um, working on the data, so I don't have results uh, yet. Um, and we're actually working with the uh, paradigms of Marlu Koiker. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, so yeah, it's uh, the 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 fun thing is that it doesn't take too long. Uh, it's only about five max ten minutes. Of course, if the children pay attention. 
<laughs> because otherwise I'll stop sharing for a moment maybe um, otherwise uh, we had had children with nystagmus for example and those who have uh, yeah big problems with their visual attention and even then five minutes for those young kids can be very uh, yeah difficult yeah yeah uh, uh, and tiring and long so you're 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 doing some work on, on, on validating that so I mean I in some sense, give us a length of time it takes to create an assessment tool then, you know, to get it all done and validated. Is this something you do within like six months or is it a year's kind of thing? Years kind of thing, yes, <laughs> for sure. Um, like, yeah, the development of it sometimes already takes six months to a year because you really want to be sure that you're making the right materials. You have to do a feasibility study first, sometimes check it out. We didn't do that for the GCVI toddlers, but I don't think Kathleen told that for the, the pictures of the civet. We had actually a master thesis student who had um, a visual impairment, so she had low vision. Um, but she, we wanted to make sure that at least somebody with an, an acuity of 0 0.2, but that's Snellen notation, um, was able to see the pictures. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah, it's, it took us a year and then you have to count a year or sometimes even more to collect all the normative data, uh, analyze it, and then, yeah, you still have to do the validation uh, study. You can do the reliability study in between when you're doing the normative uh, data. But um, yeah, the further steps still take uh, a year or longer, uh, depending on how difficult it is to find the children that you want to assess, of course. Um, so yeah. It, yeah. I, it, mean, I mean, that's right. I mean, <laughs> currently, you know, um, I'm working with a group of colleagues over in the States developing this test and we're, you know, we're looking at about two, three, possibly four years, you know, it just takes time, you know, and, you know, in order to get it properly validated and make sure it's reliable, you know, going back to those concepts again, it just takes a lot of time, you know, you know we just have to, and we have to spend that time, you know, but luckily we're able to talk to each other and, and, and try and work that out. So what else are you working on? So you, you mentioned uh, uh, games, a few things. So um, uh, uh, look, as you can tell, I love games, right? So, 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 <laughs> <laughs> so, so how, how, how is games and um, what is that? Well, it's serious gaming, of course. Um, um, so the, the idea was, um, well, because all kids are playing with the games and actually children with CVI are also game players and they can play sometimes very difficult games, even if you would spec suspect they're not able to. Um, but so the idea was, uh, why not use that um, in order to get them trained huh? for certain um, dimensions, let's say, of visual perception. And so my dream was if we feed their results of their assessments to the computer and that the computer can decide what kind of game he chooses and also at what uh, level that the, 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 the child would start. Uh, and then they will get trained in the dimensions that they need to be trained in the hope, of course, that at the end of the trajectory, they will get better. <laughs> um, so the, the games are supposed to be yeah, adaptive and individually uh, tailored eh? so that uh, not every child just plays the same game. And also that when we have them train, that at least we think we know what they are training yeah <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, yeah. And, and this is to to um uh to develop different aspects of their visual perception and and visual attention and visual understanding and your representation correct yeah, yeah. Your representation yeah maybe yeah yeah you know i you can't you can't dismiss it yeah <laughs> <laughs> so so how far yeah. so how far along are you on this yeah that was, that's also a very long uh, project. So we started actually three, 
uh, yeah, somewhat more than three years ago. Um, and so now we developed uh, nearly the final prototype, which we will then be using in the randomized controlled trial. So right, okay, okay. Three years of funding, and now we have another four years of funding to uh, work on the adaptivity first, uh, further. And then in the, in the next three years, we will do the randomized controlled trial um, to see whether, yeah, we think it trains, we, whether it trains what we think it will train. Ah, right, okay, yeah. The kids, whether we, the kids will come out better, um, not only um, tested by uh, standard visual perceptual testing, but also by uh, using more ecologically valid instruments. And what does it do on their daily functioning? Yeah. Um, and eye tracking will be a part of that as well. Yeah. Right, okay, okay. And, yeah. and, and just interesting part of that you said the ecological thing, will you be using ICF as well as a measure on that? Just the, the... Um, oh, oh, well, <laughs> that's a good question. Um, I think in our project description, we did not really use the ICF, but um, of course, that's that's how we build it up in the sense that you want to work on the on the function, but also on how they well find tools in order to be sure that their activity activity or participation will grow as well. Uh, but that's a difficult one. Um, but in any case, um, what we will, for example, also use are the paradigms of Lotfi and that oh, they, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that they developed. Um, uh, looking in yeah cluttered scenes um all their virtual well their, their virtual reality games etc yeah to see pre and post whether there's a difference there as well ah, okay Hoping okay think that that translates a little bit to the real world huh? yeah <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, i mean those paradigms uh, that labs developed great you know i think it's 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 um uh, uh, I think a lot of us are looking at that and going, hmm, we could actually use that to do this, to do that, to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so uh, yeah, we're going to collaborate on, on that one. So that's nice. All right, that's excellent. Good, good, good. Yeah, but so, yeah, um, what what the game development is, is concerned. So um, what we first wanted to, to really do is make a, a profile of the kids because yeah feeding the results of the assessments to the computer he will of course not know what to do with that um so we we tried to find ways to boil down the results of of all our testing to certain visual perceptual dimension if if i can share my screen oh, yes yes i yes. can show some of that um uh, work as well where are we oh, here um, so I've got some um, a slide on the project uh, in general, actually, because we started out, and, that, and that's really uh, fun, but it also takes time with the focus groups with the children and their parents and caretakers as well, in order to know, yeah, what what are the difficulties they run into uh, when they play games, or what kind of games do they really like. Uh, what is difficult for them, etc. Um, and then we did um, a brainstorm with the company that makes uh, makes the prototypes. Uh, and that's really a fun process because what they do is just uh, shuffle around with uh, kinds of um, kinds of games like a card game or it's an adventure game. And then they put one of the yeah, visual perceptual difficulties, um, yeah, against it and then you have to think about what concept will we work out here eh? <laughs> um, and the, the other thing then was the development of that visual perceptual profile so in order to do that we looked first of all at the questionnaire and then we we looked at the um at the results of our testing and and i will show another slide on that and the next thing was that yeah in order to for the children to play our games, it needs to be motivating and it needs to uh, not to be too difficult to yeah, use all the 
how would I say, the, the keys and they can use the mouse and then it's obvious for them what they need to do. So their enjoyment and their uh, user experience has to be um, evaluated as well. But it's it wasn't easy to find a suitable tool, so certainly not for children with CVI, um, to be able to evaluate that in uh, that enjoyment. Um, and so right now we're actually finished the, the pilot testing of um, uh, typically developing and with children with CVI. And we're at the stage where we're going to do now a four week trial with the games in children with CVI in order to test the adaptivity and uh, yeah, the, the concept of the games uh, again, so that we're really sure that we can start the RCT in, uh, in time. But then this is really the visual perceptual profile that we came up with um, when looking at all the testing that we do in the clinic. So here you can see all the tests that we use in our uh, children. Yeah. Um, and actually, first, we also did some statistical uh, factor analysis on it, uh, multiple rotations. But actually, none of the solutions that came out was really very yeah, sensible, very ecologically, you, you couldn't explain it. And, and what you saw was that all the results of the, of the, all the subtests of the different tests actually cluttered together. And so it didn't. Uh, okay, right. So yeah, yeah. So what, yeah. So what we did next was do like a Delphi survey with the uh, vision scientists. Kathleen worked on that uh, with us as well, uh, and clinicians. And we just sat down uh, individually. Uh, and our PhD students interviewed us, what do you think uh, this is under that dimension or another dimension? And so finally, we came to a consensus um, of uh, six visual perceptual dimensions and um, yeah, um, organized or classified um, the, the different sub tests of the different tests under those visual perceptual dimensions. So based on that now, uh, you can feed the results to the computer. He will calculate the z-scores of the different uh, test results and then come up with a z-score of the, the different visual perceptual dimensions. And so based on that, um, you, can, um, you can calculate what are the strengths and the difficulties of your child. What exactly does he have difficulties with? Uh, so what exactly do we have to train? And that's the purpose. Right, out of these five perceptual domains, visual discrimination, object, print, spatial, visual spatial uh, perception, I'm reading their figure ground, motion perception, and visual short-term memory. A lot of people listen to podcasts, so they like it to be read out, you oh, see. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, yeah, so, um, uh, wow, okay. So, and then, it, so you'll be able to then, obviously, so the object of the game then will be, to trade so so the child might be really good on on aspects of um object and print recognition but in terms of motion perception might not be so strong and so you'll develop games new, new the computer will say look do these kind of games to yep. enhance motion perception so yep. that's that, that's our outcome that's the end that's the end and uh, we have developed uh, the games already uh, wow gosh you've done a lot of them yeah yeah yeah, 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 yeah. So we have uh, four mini games now because it was impossible to put everything in one game. Um, so we we developed four different type of games also because it aims for children between age ranges of three and 12. So we needed a bit of a spread also in the difficulty grades. Um, and so here matchmaker is mainly uh, targeted to object recognition, of course, yeah, because as you can see here, this is mid level difficulty. Um, you then um, show pictures just with a contour or with pieces mm -hmm. missing, uh, etc. pieces occluded noise, um, for example, and, and so like in, in hurricane chaos, it's more about a clutter. So in the beginning, it's, it's a very, very simple scene, but then it gets more and more uh, difficult and the child just has to click on one of the, 
what do you call it um one of the buttons over here and then and the voice over will say what he has to look for and then he has to look for it in the scenery and the better he gets the more cluttered the the objects will be closer to each other more all right okay so i was wondering how yeah. you do that because we we've been toying with the idea of of doing a you know stimulus match um test but with like a cluttered background per se you know like a tartan background kind of thing you know just just to just to you know really enhance that you know you got your foreground background and that tartan it's not tartan but it's cluttered you know it's a it's a really mm -hmm. messy background and then and then stimulus and match right so i'm always really interested in how people are assessing clutter and how they're going to do that yeah yeah, yeah. So, but so, quite... i think it was nice to see at the eacd um last week where uh Lotfi and his group also presented a a poster on the results of their uh, uh, the the virtual games that we talked about a few minutes ago. That that um, yeah, it, it they designed it a bit in the same way as we do the hurricane chaos here, in the sense that the the, the objects are first more in the center, then they get a little bit spread out, and on the other hand, you get more and more um, objects that overlap. And, and you could clearly see in the results of their study as well that it, it gets more difficult when you do it that way. So we were happy <laughs> to see that, that we seem to do it the right way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I might have to think about, about, about that. I mean, in some sense, I mean, your background there, you've got a cluttered background anyway. You know, you've got the trees and the different levels of hills and stuff like that. So, so you know, it, it's not too far away, but yeah, good, good. This is why I do these conversations else, just so I can go, oh, okay, I need to do this now. <laughs> <laughs> That's no. good. We, we love That's to right. give it, other it, people it, that inspiration. <laughs> That's right. In theory, it's meant to be about the public dissemination and understanding of CVI. But in reality, it's for me to go, wow, that's brilliant. I need to, I need to think about my own work. <laughs> <laughs> but everyone knows that. Everyone knows that. Okay, good. Tell me about Maze Explorer. Well, we uh, finally, we developed two versions of that, a 2D and a 3D, because the 3D, we thought it would be much too difficult for the younger ones. Um, and so in the 2D, so that's flat, eh? um, the child has to go towards the carrot um, over here. So they get a little map of where they have to go to. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Is, uh -huh. yep. Where the flag is over here. And they're, um, yeah, they're starting over here. Then they have to push the buttons or stay in, in, in uh, which direction they want to go. Um, in order to find uh, that carrot. And so um, in the beginning, it's also very uh, easy, but in the higher levels, we will have more side routes, of course, and they can make more errors. It could take more time. Um, and so, yeah, in that way, we can make it uh, more difficult. And depending on the errors that they make or how good it, they can do it, they will... Um, increase in their uh, difficulty. Um, so that's more for the younger kids. And then the Maze Explorer 3D, I can assure you that in the highest levels, well, <laughs> you will probably will be able to do it, but I got lost in the maze. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and certainly when the minimap over here uh, starts to turn first and then disappears, then it's uh, really very difficult to also uh, use your visual memory. Uh, where do I have to go in order to find uh, the target? So it's, it's the same principle. You are shown a target where you have to go. Uh, in the beginning, you can uh, use the map to orient yourself. Uh, but in the end, the map disappears. Um, you have to remember it. Um, yeah, and uh, finally get to your goal. Um, so that, of course, um, yeah, trains more your visual memory and your uh, perception of motion and, and orientation. Uh, but it's it's fun. It's actually the the game that all children like the most, even the younger ones. Uh, but it's yeah, fairly difficult. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's really good. And I just I'm just looking looking at this and um you know looking at all that's there and how actually 
because I mean, I'm in the fortunate position to talk to a lot of people. Um, you know, Matchmaker reminds me a lot of what Nicola McDowell is doing in in, Aust in New Zealand. Sorry, Nicola, and she's she's developing the Austin uh, the Austin Assessment Tap, which is a which is a card matching one. But oh, okay, uh, 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 and she's and we're helping to validate that actually uh, ourselves. Ooh. Um, okay. uh, and, and we're able to use some eye tracking on that as well. And she's got some really interesting preliminary data on the eye tracking and the ma and the um, card matching series is there. Yep. So, so, so uh, thank God I'm doing something right. So I'm doing that right. That's quite good. The hurricane thing is a different version of what I'm doing, but it's but it's not too dissimilar. So, so, so yep. you know, it is that convergence, isn't it? We are we are beginning to get it right. We are. We know what the factors are, and we are beginning to get it right. The maze, I've not seen anything like this. So, you know, I understand, I understand Minecraft. I understand how all yeah. that works. Yeah. Um, but uh, this is well thought of. I mean, I think the difference we wanted to make was, yeah, well thought of. What do we do? How do we increase the difficulty? Um, because you have to define that. That's really a laborious uh, process. Um, because you have to look at each image. It, it was really a lot of work. We had uh, yeah, scientific people and clinicians look at all the images and they had to rate the difficulty of each image in the, in the matchmaker um, so that we were sure that we put all the images in the, in the right difficulty map, eh? so to speak. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, there are rules eh, for the difficulty adaptivity uh, of the game now they are handcrafted uh, still but the eventually what we would like to do is that um yeah we can feed the um the results of the the testing to the computer he can then decide at what level a child start but he will also based on what the gameplay of the child We'll, we'll quickly see, did I start at the right level, yes or no, or should I really go down? Eh? Um, and, and also based on, on the game play, um, he can then also decide to go from, yeah, level, let's say level one to level three, he can just skip levels if he thinks that it really was too, uh, too easy. Uh, in order to also keep the children uh, motivated, because if, if they have to um, just go through every level, it can be a very lengthy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. Josh, and, and so so tell me again where you're at now. You're about to go and um, yeah, validate it, right? Yeah, we are uh, now going to start four weeks of uh, playing in children with CVI in order to see that they uh, progress in their uh, playing and also to uh, assess their usability and user experience, because we also added some, uh, some themes. Uh, we, we originally had two themes, uh, and now we still added a fantasy theme and a city theme, um, so that they have more uh, variations. So we're going to look at that, and we are going to see whether they progress like we think they should progress, whether our, yeah, the estimation that we have of difficulty, whether it's correct, yes or no. And if we have all that, okay. Uh, then we are planning on starting in January with the RCT. Gosh, gosh. And you've got the normative data as well. And um, We have tested typically developing children, um, but not really, um, I mean, not to create an enormous uh, normative database. So that's a good suggestion, John. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, you're helping me. The least I can do is, you know. <laughs> Help us. Yeah. 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 Brilliant. Brilliant. Gosh. Yeah. 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 A lot of work in that, then, isn't there? You know, this is, this is, this is huge. Yeah. Yeah. So we're looking at then, so a year, so two years, we might get the results. So, so a year of testing, is that right? Uh, at least, because we really want to test like 50 of them, so it's going to take a, a while probably before we recruited them. So if we take January, yeah, sometime, somewhere the end of 2023, yeah. Yeah, yeah, gosh, well, 
you never know you can come back on conversations and you can you can report the results but great a couple of things I want to talk about before we finish, because I've kept you so long. And, and it's something really that um, you said at the beginning of describing this is um, um, if you want to go back to stop sharing, and that's OK, else, because um, is, is, yeah. is, is the importance of developing a profile. Right? I, I, I think we want to talk about that. But I want to embed that is importance of in order to get a profile of children with CVI, you know, we can do the tests that you and I are all developing and, and validating that. But how important is it listening to the parents, right? How important is it listening to, to the children themselves and the poor in order to, uh, in order to get that profile? We all agree we need to generate a profile and we need, and that profile needs to be generated of perhaps, uh, you know, some history taking, perhaps some standardized tests that we have observations all of those things but but talk to me about the importance of parents and children yeah obviously it's very important and we also learned that even more in that process of game developing because uh yeah the, the children and the parents were also very enthusiastic and then um they they have uh, lots of important things to add for us and uh, what works well and what doesn't work for them because they're the only ones who can know <laughs> exactly what they are uh, seeing and not seeing what their representation is. Um, eh? um, and also the parents, you know, that they, we feel that they are craving also for information and that they're very enthusiastic that we're doing all these things because they still feel like they themselves do not understand completely what is, what is going on. Um, so yeah it's important to listen to them i mean i think that's right i think the thing that i that i've noticed is because we all know that each individual child with cvi their vision and representation i would say you know varies you know it varies a lot and and, and trying to understand the environments of which it varies you know and we think we know it's you know it's cluttered but it might only be cluttered in certain environments and with certain maybe auditory sounds might impinge on that cluttered and you know and by listening to parents and getting that understanding we can start to build you know that variability of vision within that child you know i, I think that's really important you know and it's also important i think that they talk to each other in order to get to see the heterogeneity themselves uh of the different uh, children uh, for them to understand better and for us, yeah, also to get a better view on the extent of the problem, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, good. And I guess my, I guess yeah, the last thing is, I suppose, and I don't know if you thought about this, but it seems instant for me. I mean, the gaming and the results are there as well. I mean, how, I mean, I, as you know, I'm based in the School of Education. I am a psychologist, but I am based in the School of Education. So I'm going to ask the, the teacher the QTVI question, right? I always like to end on a QTVI yeah. question. You know, I've got some, some, some kind of like loyalty to the QTVI band, mm -hmm. right? So, yeah. um, so, so how, not necessarily just the game stuff, but maybe we can start with that. How is the work that you do and the results that you do, and just even in practice, how can the QTVIs benefit from it? How can the QTVIs then take it forward and in their daily practice? And it's, it's a little unfair because you are a pediatrician, you're not a, you're not a QTVI, but I'm going to ask oh, you. Oh, no, but <laughs> I have no problem at all with that question because um, I think I am a multidisciplinary person. <laughs> sense that I, I love to work with the teams and I have a lot of teams that I work with and, and part of those are the QTVIs. We don't call them like that in, in, in Belgium. Um, but um, yeah, we work closely with them and they, they're they actually involved in the gaming uh, project um, because we want their opinion on what we develop for the for the children as well and we because we want them to use it afterwards as well uh, if they don't like it they will never uh, use it anyway 
Um, but so of all the work that we've been doing, I think they can, their valuable opinion uh, or we, we value their opinion on the questionnaires as well. And we always send them a questionnaire, not only the parents, but also the teachers, uh, because they work with the children uh, all day and they know them very well. Um, can they use some of our assessments? Well, like uh, Kathleen also said, we, we have no problem with them using those batteries if we are convinced that they can use it properly, <laughs> then yeah, then there is then, then it doesn't matter who does the assessments. Um, if we can all work together, that's uh, that's fine. Well, well, I think I think look, all of you QTVIs or TVIs or whatever your 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 names are professionally. This is a call out. You know what is it? because we've got some excellent researchers like Els here who are willing to do this, who can spend five years in developing <laughs> sophisticated- If you have tools. money. <laughs> yeah, 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 you need to be funded. Yeah, yeah, we get that, uh, you know, in, in, in order to do this. But, you know, so, so yeah, so maybe um, QTVIs, let me know and I can let Els know or let Els know what, what do you, what is it that you need when you go home that that's not being answered currently, I think. Yeah, that's a good yeah, way yeah. to end that on. Yeah. Look, I've taken up look an hour of your time. Uh, um, it's been it's been fantastic and and fun. Uh, um, we've had a couple of uh, sessions together before we've done this, so um, every one of them I've really enjoyed and I've learned a lot. And um, so I just want to say. On behalf of, of myself and everyone else who's watching, I'd like to say thank you very much, Els. You're Thank welcome. You. <laughs> I hope we got a few messages there, unanswered questions, of course. <laughs> yeah, always. And look, you know, anytime you want to come back and deliver some results, you know, I'll be in my study, same shirt, and uh, I'll be there probably in five years' time as well. Okay. All right, Els, thank you so much. And I'll thank you very you. much. Bye bye, John. Bye bye. bye, -bye.